Hello everybody, welcome to cocktail hour for fish. We're going to be feeding uh, my favorite fish, my weird fish, my beautiful fish. Um, we'll be taking a look at feeding uh, their favorite little cocktail. I do this a couple times a week, but it's just tank water from the warmest tank I have. And then we've got a nice bit of blood worms in there. We've got uh, emerald entree, which is for omnivores. It's kind of a... It's a frozen food you can get at most box stores, but it's a uh, San Francisco Bay brand, and uh, it's, uh, if you take a look at it here, it's it's mostly uh, green. So it's uh, spirulina, shrimp, plankton, krill, spinach, romaine, lettuce, dried uh, brewer's yeast, and vitamins, all the vitamins, and magnesium, uh, all the kind of uh, greens that a vegetarian fish or an algae eater would really like. And then we've got um, Mycetes shrimp frozen, We've got baby brine shrimp frozen. We've got adult brine shrimp frozen. And then we've got the last two ingredients that I think are key. Um, really the heart of this, this mix that I like to feed all my tanks pretty much uh, from nano upwards uh, is the, the blood worms as the base and then the uh, daphnia, frozen daphnia. All the little fish really like this. Uh, and then uh, the cichlid formula. This is great for like pea puffers and things. Um, at least in my case, I've found that when they won't eat anything other than like snails and bloodworms, oftentimes you can take one of these and they, they have a gelatin in them. So they're gelatin based, even though the main ingredients are salmon, uh, shrimp, kelp, halibut, cod, spirulina, shrimp, eggs, and then it's gel binder and then a bunch of vitamins. But these hold up together like a clam or like um, kind of like uh, you know a calamari or something like that so they've got the kind of uh, spongy or uh, uh, gummy uh, texture to them which the the certain fish that really want something meaty go for that uh, if they want a big bite of something so kind of gets everybody what they need and then I use a turkey baster out of here as it all separates um, and I'll mix it all together and we'll take a look at what we go feed in a moment. So, yeah. All right, so our cocktail is brewing, starting to warm up. Uh, sometimes you can put warm water around it, like another pan, or you can just wait. You can just wait your time. Uh, patience is a virtue in fish keeping, but you can see that the green uh, and the red and the, the beige and the, uh, the ones that have the calamari texture kind of staying perfect cubes might want to cut those up with a, a little knife or scissors or something last thing i like to put in there is um one of the pre-minced garlic cubes you can buy in the frozen section uh fish just love garlic it's in a lot of foods anyways but especially if their stomach's hurting or upset and uh, they're not in the mood to eat it really does encourage that so let's feed some fish all right here's the lovely uh bloody mary of sorts uh, and we've got the big stuff. Big chunks here will go to the cichlids and things. But in here first, let's get some blood worms, some Mises shrimp, and some brine shrimp. We'll get that all going. I like to spread it out. Uh, just if you're ever curious how to feed more finicky fish, I like to spread it out, put some um, floating, some sinking. With the turkey baster, you can definitely get also just like the... Uh, the finer points if you need it so if you just want the the fine stuff or if you just want blood worms for instance and you know that you've got say uh some pleco babies or for instance these guys that are shy down here these these um uh nanochromis we can make sure that they're getting their share um by bringing it right to them and you don't want to overfeed so definitely Whatever they can't eat, um, unless you've got scavenging fish that are going to be helping out, whatever they can't eat within two or three minutes is probably too much food. You can kind of give it a little more time, maybe five minutes with frozen food. Sometimes it takes them a minute to kind of latch on and realize that uh, dinner's served, but uh, usually they'll still go for it pretty quickly. You can see that those little teeny um, Daphnia are a hot little hot commodity for all the little fish and sometimes that can keep fish busy when you've got big fish that are competing uh, for the food like we'll see in just a second here we're gonna have more more competition coming in so we'll get that chunky uh, 
soupy broth part from the bottom and bring it in over here, bring it right up to the top, let it kind of just fall in one corner. All the bigger fish will kind of swarm that first. Um, I don't need to tell you this if you guys have had fish a long time, but I figure I've never really made a video talking about um, how I feed frozen. And, uh, and then I like to, like I said, get down and uh, kind of bring the food right to the little ember tetras and things like that. The other thing I like to make sure is, um, you know, again, we got some more nanochromis over here. Really pretty fish. Uh, and they can feed, they can strike <laughs> really hard. They're kind of entertaining to watch eat. Um, and same with the gouramis. Also, side note, is that these Siamese algae eaters, the reticulated Siamese algae eaters, will eat the blood worms uh, just voraciously. They'll eat anything other than algae uh, if it's in there. So they won't be doing much algae duty if you feed them frozen food, especially that they love, uh, like this stuff. Now, these guys are carnivorous plecos. These are the uh, the uh, leopard frog pleco. And you can probably see here, too, we'll tuck it out of the way. One's kind of hiding in its hut here. Um, but we've got four of these in there. And so when they're guarding the, the fort kind of like that, I actually like to make sure, just in case we've got um, a father guarding the brood um, or a mother just guarding a hut in general, I like to make sure that I get them some good blood worms and some of the chunkier stuff and get that right, like drop that right near them because they're not going to back out very far. And, you know, really the same goes for... Um, these bristle nose plecos back here. Now that was kind of dumb of me because the filter intakes here But like I said those Siamese algae eaters are gonna come in They'll swoop in and they'll eat all of that excess for me So really we've got um, a good amount of blood worms and things in this tank And so now we can just get a few more of these lighter things and feed the the pencil fish and the ember tetras and the endlers But you can see the shrimp are actually out with the gouramis, with uh, all the other fish that normally might be uh, viewing them as dinner. And it's because there is plenty of food in this tank right now. And if you didn't know all the fish that were in here, you might think it's too much food. But it's a, it's a pretty good uh, amount of food for what's in here. Because we've got, uh, that you know, that looks like a big concentration. But we've got uh, four more of these other than, than, uh, than this one here. And this is the smallest. And then we've also got the bristle noses, and we've got uh, four nanochromis, and then, uh, so yeah, between that and then some quarries, they'll clean all that up in short order. But if you didn't have that, if you didn't know um, what, you know, how much to feed, you can always go back in with the turkey baster and whatnot, and see how easy this stuff comes back up. I mean, you can get a good amount of it just real quickly. So if need be, you can do that. Let's move on to the next room. All right, so here's probably gonna be our most voracious eaters. Um, we'll get lots of chunks in there for them. These guys can eat a lot. Now, it seems like nothing's in here, right? Let's drop a few blood worms in, see? See what happens. Now, this is a late feeding, and that's unusual for them. They're not used to the late feedings, so we'll kinda have to see if they wake up. We don't wanna waste all the food, but I bet they will. These are cichlids, and uh, if there's one thing cichlids do well, it's wake up and eat food. <laughs> eat food, period. Uh, while they're smelling that in the water and waking up, there's some catfish in there too. We're also going to feed some blood worms to, and Mises shrimp as well, to these rainbow fish. These are praycocks. And also to the little pea puffers. Sorry, this glass is a little dirty. But the pea puffers love the, the brine shrimp and also the uh, blood worms. The blood worms are really their jam. They like those a lot. So, that is a house favorite. Now, it is a little surprising that nobody's coming up to eat quite yet. So, it may take them a little more waking up. Sometimes, I'll have to take the juice of it, put it right into the downflow of the filter, and boom, you can see now that's starting to get them circling, waking up, and uh, thinking about food a little bit more, uh, which is good. So... They should be coming up to the top to strike, though, usually in the day. So, this is a bit anticlimactic. Now, let's move on, of course. We'll 
keep bubbling this up. Bubble, bubble, toil and trouble. See how this is holding together like calamari, like I said? This is the one we could cut up and give to uh, the bigger fish or any sort of fish like the pea puffers that want to eat a chunk of something. This tank is a kind of hill stream hybrid tank, even though it has no filter in it. But it is uh, got pandagaras in it, it's got danios in it, bettas, and some sparkling garamis, and then a whole bunch of shrimp and some snails and things. So this, this tank usually does real good with feeding also. Up here we've got some baby uh, angelfish and um, some cichlids all kind of put together so they should also uh, enjoy the blood worms. Let's see. Oh yeah, they're enjoying them. So they're going for the blood worms and then along with that um, we've got some cichlids in here so we'll see. We've also got the some gobies in here. There's the uh, Epistopanduro. Uh, male or pandarini male uh, and then the females bright yellow so she should be cruising around here somewhere probably a little shy right now but I always like to also wash out the turkey baster another no-brainer but with this loose stuff I'll feed it to the fry and whatnot that I have in other tanks um, the guppies up there will be happy with that so we'll move on we'll feed the other guppy tank we'll feed the uh <laughs> the bigger uh angels down here also got some bristle nose plecos and things in here so i like to kind of kick everything aside let there be light so to speak feed the main swarm of all the uh, boldest fish first and then we'll also feed back over here and we'll get all of the uh the smaller guys that are a little bit shy or any fry that may be in here so you can see these banded um, the Burmese banded barbs are much shyer and they'll eat over there same with like the lipstick goby things like that um, oftentimes they don't want to compete with the Danios the Tetras uh, and the angels so they'll head that way and uh, usually I like to feed no matter what tank it is near wherever the water flow is so that they can they can smell it so that it moves around, but that it's far enough away that it doesn't get sucked into the intake like it did in the other tank because I wasn't paying attention. So, let's go for feeding the the hardiest amount of bloodworms we're going to do, which is all bottom feeders. Uh, not all bottom feeders, but a good chunk of bottom feeders. This is where the mormorids are. This is the elephant nose fish, the, the plecos, there's rainbow fish. There's nanochromis in here, there's apistos in here, there's half beaks in here. So we'll feed this strategically. We'll drop a couple blood worms in, get the, the juices rolling, and some of the vegetable uh, debris in there too. And you'll see that that already has the phantom plecos, it has all the corridoras and the aspidoras definitely trying to feed. Um, so they start coming in the apistos start coming in and there's the mormorid the elephant nose fish right there it's a mormorid um, petersi uh, named after a guy with the name Peters <laughs> and uh, you can see their nose twitching and smelling and sensing as well as they've got their electrical uh, organs sensing for them and then we've got the Venezuelas Corridora. Um, those are the kind of orange and black ones there. And then the salt and pepper Corridora. And then the smallest guys here are the Aspidoras, right over here. The two that are right there. Um, and they're just kind of doing their thing. Um, they'll kind of swoop in and get what they can, kind of like the pepper Corys. The Venezuelan ones seem to be the most uh, bossy. I guess we've got the female, uh, the female Episto right over there, and then we've got the other Nanochromis coming out. Now I don't see um, the other, you know, I don't see the half beaks coming down. I don't see the um, rainbow uh, fish, the uh, Gertrude, coming down, the Pseudomagill Gertrude. So what we're going to do is we're definitely going to go back and we're going to get some of that water that has the uh, Daphnia in it and the smaller pieces and we'll float some of that 
kind of up here. I like to have floating plants, not just for, um, you know, them to feel safe and to spawn in. Also, it, another nice little hint, especially during tubbing season, with the plants all floating up here, they, they really work well as an algae grower. So if you're going to end up growing algae just because of the state of your tank, um, things like that, uh, it's a nice way for it to grow up on whatever the top layer is. Here it's hornwort. And uh, you can see that it makes the uh, half beaks feel safe. They feel like nothing's going to come up from below and, you know, nail them. And then it also makes the other fish, all the catfish, it's kind of the catfish tank, uh, feel safe as in nobody's going to come from above and nail them. Uh, but you can see they make pretty short work of even quite a bit of food in this tank. Uh, the other fish aren't even, I mean, this is only half the fish in here too. So you can see how quickly uh, quarries can make short work of worms, uh, that's for sure. Uh, and I like to call these ones my little B-52s because of their, their wings. You see their... Uh, long gene for their fins there. Those are from Aquatic Arts and their tank bread, of course. But real fun little fish and a lot of people say, wow, I've never seen any that quite that big. And they still get around just fine. Still, um, you know, put up just as much of a little uh, hubbub as any other quarry when they're feeding. And uh, Side note is, in theory, if these quarries were allowed to uh, lay eggs undisturbed, they could hybridize, but right now, um, the chances of eggs surviving in this tank is about a, a, a million to one with uh, all these bottom feeding fish in here. They would seek out the eggs from any given uh, group very quickly. So we'll get some more food for the top. And uh, then we'll also feed the rams and the loaches. And that will kind of wrap it up, really. Um, we'll get some of, like I said, some of the floating stuff stirred up again. But we want some of the vegetarian food. We can also add a little more of the, the, the big old chunks in here. Even if they don't get it now, I know, see, there's big fish in here. <laughs> there's good six six inch long fish there's six of them six inches long seven inches long and some catfish so they will come through here and they will get those big old chunks uh it's just a matter of when they're feeling frisky plus we've got the quarries at the bottom love adding quarries to pretty much every tank as basically just your your essential clean cleanup crew uh so in here don't need a lot of bloodworms in here, more so we're trying to feed the rainbow fish and a few of the, uh, there's some catfish from Burma in here, from Myanmar, and then there's also the birdsong gobies, which are more biofilm grazers and things, but all these little Pseudomagill luminatus, the thread fins, and then some of the schismatogobius will, will feed on, um, actual meaty food then over in here at the moment we've got these little monsters which are turkana red jewel cichlids and they will devour anything put in their way but we also have blue rams back in here german balloon blue rams which side note normally i would never keep but they had a whole group of them at pet uh pet smart and they were all like literally dying. There were only two or three, there, I guess there were three left, but only two survived. And I took them home, took the three home, and the two that are left are happened to be a pair. So I've kind of kept them, and they're kind of my little lucky mascots, even though they're misshapen and mutants. Uh, feel bad because all their organs are squished together and so forth, but they're back in there. and. Uh, They'll definitely need a separate tank from these guys very shortly. So, last group that we're gonna feed uh, are gonna be the, uh, we've got a few endlers in here, but really what we're looking at mostly are the uh, samurai gourami. And they tend to eat mostly these shrimp that are in here, but we also have some gold eye, um, some gold eye dwarf cichlids in here. You can kind of make them out, the glare is really bad. Um, so we need to feed all that get them all something meaty 
And just as I walked away from this tank, all the fish came out and literally there's almost nothing left of that food, of all that food that was in there 30 seconds, a minute ago. So they do make short order of it. Uh, we're also going to feed the native tank here. We've also got some erythromycrons and CPDs in here, as well as least killifish and scarlet battis and elasomas. So there's kind of an interesting mix, but they seem to be working out. It seems to be good so far. So we're happy with that. And then these guys are ready and waiting for their dinner. Females lit up with rainbow colors and the males are getting black and white. They know their, their little uh, dinner dance. And then we also have one stray Episto Borelli in here that uh, needs a friend soon, but he's over there eating too. Lastly, we've got these. And you know, I usually just feed these guys shrimp pellets, but I do like to give them um, bloodworms from time to time. It's one of the few meaty things that they will eat, which is odd because they will not even touch the newborn baby Blue Dream shrimp in here ever. Uh, they do, however, eat when I kick up the substrate. This is what they like the most. We'll kick up the substrate and they will eat the planaria. So you can actually make out the planaria when you squeeze them uh, with a puff of air. They kind of tense up into a little ball and you can see them up here in there. And normally you could just toss those out. You know, they're a pest generally. They eat your baby shrimp. But for baby panda loaches, they are like a feast. They are a meal. And every night I can just kick them up and they're kind of a renewable resource. They're these guys with the little triangular heads on the, gla on the glass. So just a few blood worms and uh, you know, Daphnia, a few other things that are in there, that will bring out more of those uh, those pest uh, worms also, the planaria, and then the uh, panda loaches will actually just keep eating them as they come out towards the food. So, works out pretty well. Checking in down on here, uh, silly fish, some of them are still just eating duckweed, breaking down off of the filter. Now, we didn't see the other marmorid, and like I said, you always want to make sure that you're keeping track of everyone and making sure they're eating, especially if you've got someone who you know is a carnivore, an insectivore, something like that. Uh, there's that balloons, uh, balloon ram. Someday we'll film, <laughs> we'll film up close. Uh, maybe just not today. But that's pretty much how easy it is. And uh, we're gonna give these guys a little more food. We're gonna give this tank a little more food on the opposite corner of where we've fed anything so far. Get some more tank water in there. Normally you don't want to get the tank water in there unless you're sure that the tank is clean and safe. Make sure that there's no, been no breakouts of anything in there. Um, and that happens to be the case right now with those tanks over there. So we're good to go. But I don't know, just thought I'd bring you along for my uh, try weekly feeding. And uh, usually I take these last pieces, if I don't cut them up, I'll just let them come out into the big tank there. That's a lot of food there. Now you have to do, I always do check the ammonia if I feed this heavily um, the next day, just in case. But uh, so far, knock on wood, no problems. And oh, the lights have gone out, so it's midnight. But then I like to wash out the cup with the same water I began with. So yeah, that's just kind of my little frozen food feeding routine. Here you can see that they've left a little bit, but we've got a lot of baby bristle nose in here, and that is why I, I allow for the leftovers uh, in certain tanks. Now if we didn't have any bottom cleaning crew that kind of takes longer to digest and kind of eats slowly all night long kind of thing, uh, then you wouldn't want that in there. That would just be making uh, problems for you. So. All right, guys. Hope you enjoyed. I'll talk to you later. Bye.